Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 10347 in the name of Neil Gray on opportunity within the 2023-24 programme for government. I would invite those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Neil Gray, Cabinet Secretary, to speak to and to move the motion up to 11 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to uh, open this debate and move the motion uh, in my name and support by colleagues uh, on how we seize the opportunities of an economy that is fair, green and growing. A wellbeing economy that helps our people and businesses to thrive through a just transition to net zero while uh, addressing the twin climate and nature emergencies. By seizing the opportunities of the transition to net zero and growing our economy, we can both reduce poverty and fund high quality public services we rely on. We are bringing forward this programme for government in challenging economic times. High inflation, rising interest rates continue to ramp up costs both for individuals and for business trading conditions. So while the headline inflation rate is beginning to fall, economic growth has weakened this year and many businesses are having to change their business models in light of the challenging economic conditions. Our businesses face the cost of the union crisis with the cumulative impacts of Brexit on trading and labour supply, sustained high inflation and interest rates, as well as the ongoing high energy costs in energy-rich Scotland. We are doing everything possible within the limited powers available to us in tight fiscal constraints to support businesses as well as households and transform Scotland's economy. However, with the powers, I will. Daniel Johnson. Whether you accept the premise of what he just said about the, 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 the cost of, of the union or, or not, what it doesn't explain is why Scotland lags behind uh, other parts of the UK in terms of future business activity or equity investment, because the data is clear that we're lagging behind parts of the UK, such as the North West, on those two measures. Cabinet and, and we're, of course, uh, you know, you look at GDP growth since 2007 and uh, per capita uh, adjusting for uh, population share, we are ahead of the rest of the UK since 2007, near double the growth rate of the rest of the UK. And we've got record levels of inward investment, as Daniel Johnson uh, will have seen and I'm sure welcomed uh, over uh, the summer. So, yes, there are challenges to what we are facing and we have to compare uh, the position that we are in uh, in Scotland as part of the UK when we compare to our European neighbours who are richer, fairer uh, and more socially just. We have to ask why not Scotland uh, and it's because we are being held back by this broken uh, economic model that has been offered to us from Westminster. I'll give way one more time. Martin Fraser. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for, for, for giving way. He's mentioned inflation. I don't know if he's looked at inflation figures in other Western economies. He's mentioned interest rates. Interest rates in the United States of America are higher the interest rates in the United Kingdom right now. Is that the fault of the Conservative government? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, that will be cold comfort to the businesses that I have been seeing, that I have been seeing uh, in the interactions that I have been having, I'm sure Murdo Fraser will have been having uh, over the summer, that are feeling the pain uh, of the energy cost crisis that has not been resolved uh, by uh, the poor market uh, conditions delivered by uh, the UK government or the inflationary pressures that have been driven up by the Truss Quartang budget yeah, that crashed the economy. I tell you, the points that Murdo Fraser made will be cold comfort to the businesses that are struggling to trade uh, right now. However, the powers of independence, we could do so much more. And our Building a New Scotland series of papers shows that independent European countries comparable to Scotland continue to outperform the UK across a range of economic and social indicators. They are wealthier, more productive and innovative, fairer and more equal. Why not Scotland? It is, presiding officer, because we are bound to a failed UK economic model and do not hold the financial levers that are required. Yeah. So supporting economic growth is central to this programme for government. Not growth for growth's own sake, but growth with a purpose, which is one of the best ways to push forward our anti-poverty agenda, deliver fair work and sustain high quality public services. Growing the economy is not something that we can do alone. We must do it in partnership with businesses, and that will require listening to the business community. We will keep doing that through the New Deal for Business Group and the Programme for Government commits us to making progress on the implementation of the group's recommendations, particularly on regulation. 
We understand the challenges facing businesses, especially the impact of cumulative regulation, and we have committed to a programme of reform. So we'll work with uh, businesses to uh, improve the way we develop, review and implement regulations, and we'll relaunch the regulatory review group and improve the business and regulatory impact assessment toolkit process. Realistically, there will, there will always be regulations that are not universally welcomed by the businesses that they apply to. But that makes it even more important to involve business in the conversation early so that their voice is heard as part of the policy development process. And where there is a good case made, we are open to removing regulations and will develop a process to do that systematically as part of our reform programme. Uh, while uh, it will be for the budget where decisions are made, we will also build on the ongoing work of the New Deal for Business subgroup uh, on non-domestic rates to ensure that we give businesses and communities the best support that we can, that they need, and to support small business in particular, a dedicated unit will be established in the Scottish Government. Businesses of all sizes tell me they have difficulties in recruiting a skilled workforce. So recognising the impact of the UK Government's post-Brexit immigration policies in the labour market, we will launch a talent attraction and migration service. But it would be so much easier if we weren't held back by the hostility to migration coming from both Labour and the Conservatives, or if we had the powers of independence to ensure that we can have a migration system that is tailored to the needs of Scotland, our economy, and the people who wish to come to Scotland to contribute to our nation. Innovation and entrepreneurship are key strands of the national strategy for economic transformation. And we will invest £15 million to help unleash talent from all walks of life in all parts of Scotland. This includes greater backing for proven uh, initiatives like Scottish Edge and the Scottish uh, Ecosystem Fund. This will help startups to scale up. It will help build clusters of innovative businesses in growth sectors and it will put our world-class universities at the heart of our economic future. The package includes uh, delivering upon uh, the vision of the Pathways report by Anna Stewart and Mark Logan, for which I thank them for their work, and through the launch of the pre-start centres and pop-ups to encourage and support women and other underrepresented groups to become entrepreneurs. Uh, I was pleased to announce uh, earlier today that the Pathways Pre-Start Fund is open with £1.5 million available for organisations to support more people into entrepreneurship and to help close the unacceptable gender gap in entrepreneurial participation. Grants of up to £100,000 will be available and the details of how to apply can be found on the Scottish Government website at gov.scot. Yesterday, I met a group of incredible women who are members of the Black Social Entrepreneurship Programme. Uh, and that discussion demonstrated to me why this funding uh, support is so important. We need to break down the barriers to women and people from black, Asian uh, and minority backgrounds, give them the confidence, the skills, the contacts and support network to start their own business. It was inspiring to hear their stories and the opportunities that we, I hope, can give them. Investment in high quality digital connectivity is also helping transform our economy. More than £600 million for the Reaching 100% programme it is delivering full fibre, gigabit capable connections and helping make up the gaps in delivery in this UK government policy area. Our rural delivery plan will set out actions to build vibrant rural communities and regions and will be empowered through the regional economic partnerships as well. As well as a growing economy, we also need a green economy, an economy that supports a healthy planet to allow us not only to meet our own uh, climate targets while securing a just transition, but also become a magnet for inward investment. Scotland continues to be the most attractive location outside London for inward investment, and we can do even better. We are at the forefront of the clean energy transition. We have the people, skills, and the resources, so we must make the most of those strengths. We will build on our forthcoming uh, final energy strategy and just transition plan to launch a green industrial strategy uh, by next summer, working closely with business, uh, industry and trade unions through its development. Uh, this will set out how the Scottish Government uh, will help businesses and investors to realise the enormous economic opportunities of the global transition in key sectors such as offshore wind and hydrogen. We'll support the workers. I'm, I'm really sorry, I'm, I'm pushed for time, but I'll try and come back in uh, later on. Uh, we'll support the workers in the oil and gas industry with our Green Skills Passport, uh, and we'll support the economy of Aberdeen in the North East with our £500 million Just Transition Fund. 
will drive investment in a new generation of onshore wind, establishing a sector deal with industry that will cut by half the average determination time for Section 36 applications to 12 months, where there is no public inquiry. And we'll drive forward on offshore wind skills development, focusing on the opportunities for diversification and skills transfer from our oil and gas sector in line with a just transition. Mobilising private investment will be a priority and a dedicated investment unit will be established to take forward the forthcoming recommendations of the First Minister's investment panel. The final component of a well-being economy is fairness, because poverty and inequality are an inhibitor to greater growth and prosperity, as Nicola Sturgeon outlined in her contribution yesterday. When Scotland's businesses succeed, so do our people. And when our people succeed, so do our businesses. So we are pledged uh, to working with employers to promote shared prosperity by boosting wages and continuing to increase the number of organisations who pay at least the real living wage. That includes rolling out fair work conditionality in a way that supports workers, but also recognises that businesses need time to adjust to. Our commitment to fund increased wages to £12 an hour for those working in social care and those delivering funded early learning and childcare in the private, voluntary and independent sectors will help address recruitment issues by attracting more people to work in these areas and will increase incomes, helping to address poverty. Improved childcare provision will also help parents and enable parents and carers to work, increase their working hours or enter training and education. And I consider this an important and key infrastructure for a wellbeing economy. Presiding officer, in, in drawing to a close, I want to reiterate this government's commitment to a fair, green and growing wellbeing economy. This government will support and invest in people and our businesses as we move on the journey to net zero in the coming year. This will help our planet create good jobs with fair wages, expand our tax base and help provide important revenue for us to invest in tackling poverty and our public services. By doing this, we will create opportunity, improving lives for people and communities across Scotland. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Murdo Fraser to speak to and to move Amendment 10347.1. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr Fraser. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, let me say at the start, I do welcome uh, the language in the programme for government around the need for economic growth. And I welcome the tone, much of the tone we've heard from the Cabinet Secretary just uh, this afternoon, because talking about economic growth is important. It is a welcome departure from uh, this government. We didn't hear much about uh, economic growth uh, in recent times, perhaps because of the presence of the anti-growth Greens uh, in the coalition. But the Cabinet Secretary is right, because growth is essential. Because without growth, we can't have expanding businesses, we can't have secure, well-paid jobs, and crucially, we can't have the tax revenues we are going to need if we're going to fund our vital public services. And we only have to look at the warnings, the very stark warnings from the Fiscal uh, Commission about the black hole that's looming in the Scottish public finances, how that's only going to expand over time, to see we cannot afford the present level of public services that we have uh, on the levels of taxation we have. So if we're not going to punish people with more taxes, which would be a huge mistake in my view, the only way we're going to raise more tax revenue is to expand the economy. So I welcome the rhetoric. Whether the delivery will be there, that remains to be seen. Now, there's two important background statistics that inform this debate. The first is the data that was released just last week, showing that the Scottish economy in the second quarter of this year is estimated to have contracted by 0.3%. And this contrasts with the quarterly growth for the UK in the same period of 0.2%. That's a difference in performance over a quarter, just three months, of half of 1%. And that ties in with a longer term trend, where since 2014, the Scottish economy has grown on average at one half of the UK rate. And we know, despite all the uh, rhetoric we've heard from both SNP and indeed Labour benches in this Parliament over the last year, that the UK economy now uh, performed much more strongly than was previously thought. Uh, yeah, if the Cabinet Secretary wants to intervene. Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. I thank Murdo Fraser for uh, giving way. I've already outlined the fact that since 2007, uh, GDP growth in Scotland has outperformed uh, the rest of the UK. But taking that point, uh, even if we do take that point, uh, why is it then uh, that the IFS today are saying that social mobility in the UK is at its worst place for 50 years? Surely we must ensure that we invest in the well-being element as well as the economy element to make sure that that GDP growth, that growing economy, is benefit benefiting people. 
I'm all benefit everyone if we grow the economy. The, 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 point, the point that the Cabinet Secretary made about going back to 2007, yes, I would accept. The Scottish economy grew more rapidly in the period 2007 to 2014, thanks to oil and gas. That's not much use to us now. The, the record in more recent years is a much less impressive one, and that's what it needs to be focusing on. Now, we know the UK economy has performed much better than we previously thought, because thanks to a revision of data by the Office of the National Statistics, we now know the UK economic performance coming out of COVID uh, was stronger than we thought. It's now 0.6% bigger, the UK economy, uh, than pre-COVID. And was, let, let me just make this point, and was third fastest in the G7 and faster than any other major European economy. And since 2010, our economic growth has outperformed that of Germany and France and Japan. And that's a very different picture from the one we've heard painted on the other benches, including from Mr Johnson, who I'll now be happy to hear from. Daniel Johnson. On a similar note in terms of picking your time frames, does uh, Murdo Fraser not need to acknowledge that UK growth has been depressed compared to the OECD average since 2008? Would he have a reason why that might be the case? Well, Murdo Fraser. Mr Johnson has not been listening. Since 2010, our economic growth has outperformed that of Germany, France and Japan. And he maybe hasn't up to date with the ONS revision of statistics. Maybe he should get back and read the figures. But in actual fact, we now know the UK economy is performing better. So it's not to say there's not still significant challenges facing the UK economy, as indeed face all Western economies. But this narrative of the UK economy as the sick man of Europe is now exposed as totally bogus. Now, the challenge for us here in Scotland is how do we ensure our economy here at least matches the UK average? Now, the second piece of data, presiding officer, comes in the study published just last week by the Fraser of Allender Institute of Business Attitudes. Just 9%, 9% of Scottish firms agree that the Scottish Government understands the business environment in Scotland. 64% of businesses disagree. That's a damning verdict on this Government's approach to business. And only 8% of businesses actually think the Scottish Government engages effectively with their sector. So there's much more to be done if this government's new deal with business is to be anything other than empty uh, rhetoric. So we will need, against this background, to ensure we're delivering stronger economic growth. And it's not going to be enough to talk about it. We need action rather than words. And in that context, some of what was announced in the programme for government we would welcome, although it falls short of what's required. We certainly do need a competitive tax regime in Scotland in relation to the rest of the UK. Now, we heard from the First Minister uh, this week that he'd written to the Prime Minister calling for cuts in corporation tax. It's a rich irony for the First Minister in a government that has hiked taxes for middle earners in Scotland, now apparently in favour of tax cuts. But as usual with the SNP, they want other people to cut yeah. taxes. They just don't want to cut the taxes they control themselves, yeah. where the only direction of travel is upwards. Yeah. And we continually hear from those in the business community, and again, it was in the, in the papers today, the differential tax rates in Scotland act as a barrier to attracting the best talent to come and live and work here. That's why we are committed to at least reducing taxes to the UK level as a driver to promote faster economic growth. And we know that if the, if, I'm sorry, I'm going to run out of time. Um, and we know that if the Scottish growth at least matched that of the UK over a 10 year period, that would give us an additional £7 billion in tax revenues without increasing tax rates. Now, business regulation continues to be an issue. So in the programme for government, there's a commitment to work with businesses to address the issue of uh, regulation and remove regulations no longer required. Well, the Scottish Government can address that right now. There's a huge issue in the tourist sector right now with the licensing scheme for short-term lengths, affecting not just self-catering properties, but bed and breakfast, guest houses, home shares and house swaps. And we're warned by those in the sector that this could cost thousands of jobs and millions of pounds to the economy if the government doesn't think again. So if this government is serious about tackling regulation, about a new deal for business, about listening to business, as it says it is, it can demonstrate that right now by taking action to review this licensing scheme and postpone it. And if it doesn't do that, all we've got is empty rhetoric. Presiding officer, I'm, I'm nearly out of time. Let me just say in conclusion, if I can, can I commend to the Cabinet Secretary an excellent publication from last week, Grasping the Thistle, not the book by Michael Russell, of course, but the new Scottish Conservative economic strategy, bursting with ideas, bursting with ideas about how to take the Scottish economy forward. If he wants to sit down with me and discuss that, 
and work out how we can work together to grow the Scottish economy. I'm right with him, Presiding Officer, and I have pleasure in moving the amendment in my name. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. And I now call Daniel Johnson to speak to and to move Amendment uh, 10347.2. Up to six minutes, please, Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I move the amendment in uh, my name. And let me be, uh, begin by saying that there are things in the programme for government that we can agree with. I mean, specifically uh, around the, the pledges to accelerate consenting and planning processes. As the Cabinet Secretary knows, this is of vital importance so that we can realise our renewables uh, uh, potential. But also, uh, and again, as I've said to him, the scale of change and indeed just the level of building of infrastructure required, I think will be significant and we have to prepare public opinion for that. So I look forward to seeing the detail of those plans because those consents have to come through more quickly than they are right now. I'm, I'm happy to. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, just very briefly, I appreciate that the constructive nature of, of, of Daniel Johnson's uh, opening remarks and, and I'll commend to him that what is coming in the onshore sector deal and we'd be more than happy to discuss with him uh, how we can ensure that there is a united front around the need for the infrastructure that is going to be required for us to realise our energy potential because it is going to be substantial. Daniel Johnson. I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that. But, but likewise, there are other points where we can agree. Uh, you know, such as the additional support uh, resources going in for start-ups and small businesses. And we agree with the Fair Work Agenda and the, the increase in pay for uh, social care workers and childcare to £12 an hour. But we have to look at the detail. The £15 million promised is less, it's a fraction of the £57 million that was cut from the enterprise budget from the previous year. And likewise, the £12 uh, per hour pay rise it's coming three years after we first called for it and is now worth substantially less than it was because of inflation. So uh, this week, Scotland needed a bold programme for government which matched the scale of the cost of living crisis and recognised the massive economic opportunity that we have in Scotland. But as usual with this government, the spin in the build-up was much greater than the substance that was delivered. In the build-up, we heard that we would have here plans that would unleash Scotland's economic potential but reading through the bullet points, little has been offered more than meetings, consultations and more working groups. That is simply not good enough. After 16 years in government, it's not good enough that this fine government finally notices the economy. And it's not good enough that we have a First Minister who thinks that it's an achievement to use the phrase economic growth in his speech. We need a First Minister who knows that the achievement is delivering economic growth and having a plan and determination to deliver it. Because the reality is the economic data is stark. Now, while I, I think Murdo Fraser was a little bit selective in his use, what I do agree is that we need to look at the broad range of data. Our growth has contracted by 0.3% in, in the last quarter. And over the longer term, I think there are serious concerns. But I think even if you look at more microeconomic data, there is a, a good deal more that we need to do. Uh, the number of VAT registered businesses in Scotland has fallen by over 4,000 since 2020. And if we look at our regional uh, competitors and other devolved nations, we are lagging behind. As I mentioned, the RBS uh, PMI report makes this very clear, that business confidence in Scotland is lower than any other nation or region in the UK. Future business activity is near the bottom of the table. And on job creation, we are ninth out of 12th. There are economic realities and, and reasons that we need to face up to, and if we don't, businesses will continue to invest in Manchester and Leeds rather than Edinburgh and Glasgow, and, and just in a moment. And that is the reality. That's what business leaders are saying to me, and I have no doubt they're saying to the ministers on the front bench. And if we, unless we have a plan that faces those economic challenges, acknowledges where we have weaknesses, we simply will not make progress. Happy to give way. Cabinet Secretary Mary McCullough. Thank you, Daniel Johnson, for getting away. And I note the um, economic pressures that he narrates that have taken place over the last few years. I just wonder whether he would agree that returning to the European Union and to free trade across the member nations thereof would be a positive thing for our economy, and whether he can confirm whether Scottish Labour supports Scotland's return yeah, to the EU. Absolutely. Daniel Johnson. Can't argue is that the way you deal with additional borders and barriers is by creating new ones with our closest trading partner. That is incoherent and what you can't do is explain why why there are regions in this and uh, nations in this country that are outperforming Scotland which have less economic powers less economic levers than Scotland I would suggest that is a sign of this government's economic failure and nor have we had detail on things that we could have expected more detail on 
The Withers report set out a number of substantial changes, some of which I agree with, some of which I don't, but we needed to hear more because we need to overhaul our skill system so that we move beyond a skill system that is focused on introducing uh, young people into the world of work to one that also reskills and upskills. And that is vital if we're going to realise our renewables potential. Now, it was also good to see that clearly the First Ministers and the Government have been listening to our critique of this Government. But let me just say, I think some of those attacks belie the error in their economic understanding. So this Government and this Parliament has been too focused on social policy to the exclusion of economic policy. But it reveals the narrowness of this Government's binary perspective on all issues, which means that they think that it has to be either or. Let me be very clear. We believe in a successful growing economy, so you deliver the tax receipts, so you can pay for the social policies and the public services. Social policy is vital, but you only get to deliver it if you have a successful economic policy. That is Labour's vision, and that is what lies behind our plans for GB Energy and the Green Prosperity Plan, to have a plan that will directly invest through a state-owned company in our future and our economic strategy. And that is why we have convened an independent advisory board for growth, so we can bring together leaders from across finance, energy, food and drink, arts and culture and trade unions to help deliver a plan for Scotland through partnership and cooperation. This debate is about opportunity, but the opportunity this country needs is to get rid of this tired, drifting government and replace it with one that is uh, focused on delivering a plan, realising our economic opportunities and delivering for everyone in this country. An opportunity and a plan Scottish Labour is determined to deliver. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Johnson. And I now call on Willie Rennie. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Rennie. Yeah, I've been through um, many programmes for government, and others, I have to say, have been quite exciting on occasions. I, for a, as a political geek, I, I was enjoying many of those occasions. Today, this week, I have to say it's been completely uninspiring. The lack of appreciation, even from their own backbenchers from the programme for government was evident earlier on this week because no not so, because the government in reality has no ideas and no money it's over committed and it's not managed its public finances well and it has no direction as a result the programme for government was full of minutiae but also with dispensed policies Take the council tax. They used to be in favour of scrapping it completely. We have been through many reform discussions. None of resulted in anything. And now they've resorted to hiking it up more than they've ever done uh, before. Yes. Cabinet Secretary. Does Willie Rennie accept, will he, will he uh, acknowledge the fact that we are looking to expand early learning and childcare? We're looking to pay uh, childcare uh, workers £12 an hour. We're paying social care workers £12 an hour. We're bringing forward a green uh, industrial strategy. Does he, not uh, does he not support any of those proposals that are within the programme for government? He, he just has to wait, because I'm coming to those issues. Because those issues are far from satisfactory. As he well knows, they don't solve the problems that have been evident in the system for some time. But council tax, never mentioned that, council tax was scrapping, now hiking up more than ever before. Was going to have a replacement for Erasmus, now it's just a pilot. They were going to scrap the dental charges for NHS treatment, now they're going to be increased more than ever. We were going to have a peace institute, now that's gone. A deposit return scheme, that's gone. Even the de facto referendum, which this government agreed to wholeheartedly before, that has even been ditched. At the heart of this very government is independence, but even that policy has been dispensed with. But there's very little progress on other areas as well. And I'll talk about early learning and childcare of the Minister is listening. The problem with early learning and childcare is that the difference in pay rates from the state provision for private and voluntary nurseries versus council nurseries. And the result of that is an exodus of experienced staff over into other areas, whether it's the council or other jobs. £12 an hour will pay those at the bottom more, of course, and that's welcome. Will it deal with experienced staff exodus? No, it will not. They have still got the fundamental problem of being able to retain good staff in the private and voluntary sector. And the problems are going to be stored up for the future 
because we need the private and voluntary sector in order to give us the flexibility we need for the future workforce. So the government has, no, not just now, the government have missed the point completely on the nursery sector. And it's all about tinkering and it's all about minutiae. If you look at other areas, social care, was that no, not just now, we promised that delayed discharge was going to be abolished completely. I think back in 2016. Now we've got the longest waits ever and the biggest staff shortages ever. The adult disability payment promised there was going to be this great new system, incredibly long waits for people waiting on their payments. The poverty-related attainment gap, as long as it's ever been. S3, appalling rates. And for the government to boast that somehow stagnation in other areas is progress I think lets down young people. Housing, social housing, the lowest number of new starts in social housing for some time. We have got fundamental problems in this government's performance. It can't even do the things it promised to do. But I want to talk about agriculture for a section, because this is somewhere that they could take and give some clarity to farmers. Now, the targets are to reduce emissions from the agricultural sector by 31% by 2032. Do we have the necessary details for the farmers to act and change their practice and invest in their farms? No, we don't. We've got the tiers. We've got the broad outline. Have we got any numbers attached to any of those tiers? No, we don't. And there's a big argument going on with the environmental sector about how much you put in each tier. And I get that. But you won't solve that problem by avoiding the issue. So for the sake of our climate and for the sake of our food and drink, we need to get on and provide clarity uh, for the farmers. Now, earlier on today, I was outside the parliament. Uh, I was speaking to college lecturers. And those college lecturers have been in industrial dispute for, I would think, probably ever since I've been in this parliament, for 10, 11 years. Now, and the reason for that is, this government has undervalued the college sector for all of that time. And if we're going to invest in our future, if we're going to invest in the skilled workforce that the minister talked about in terms of renewables, we're going to have to invest in our colleges. But the first act of the new education minister when he came into post was to cut multi-million pounds from the budget. How is that investing in our young people and their future? and our colleges. So I think we'll have more industrial dissent unless this government gets its act together with the college sector. I want to just conclude with one final thing. Scotland is a massive opportunity, but we are not going to exploit that massive opportunity unless we create the infrastructure. And the warning about this is BIFAB. BIFAB, we invested £50 million pounds and we didn't create any jobs in the back of it. And they couldn't even build the jackets for the NNG wind farm that we can see from the Fife coast. That is the warning from this government. They need to get their act together. Less of the talk about independence, more about getting stuff done. Thank you, Mr Rennie. And we will now move to open uh, speeches. And I call Ivan McKee to be followed by Brian Goodall. Mr McKee. Uh, thank you, President Officer. President Officer, last night I hosted in this Parliament an event um, by Scottish Financial Enterprise. This morning I was at a breakfast event with Scottish Renewables, and this evening I'll be going to uh, an event with uh, Scotland Food and Drink. The reason I mention these, President Officer, is because those are three uh, great examples amongst many of sectors where Scotland is genuinely leading the world and has huge potential to deliver our economic, uh, economic opportunity. And the scale of that opportunity is, is enormous. And I just want members to reflect and the government to reflect on something happening across the sea in Ireland, where the government's biggest economic challenge at the moment is how to invest and what to do with the 65 billion euro surplus they're projecting over the next four years. That's the size of the prize if you get your economy uh, moving in the right direction and invest uh, in business and sectors to deliver 
on that potential. Clare Island is a different, um, a, a, a different economy and a different country, not least because it's got the full powers of independence, but many other things are different. But it shows that if you're focused on what Scotland can do with those sectors and elsewhere, there is enormous potential. Uh, what have we achieved? Well, as has already been mentioned, Scotland's foreign direct investment performance is uh, the best in the UK outside of London. Our exports growing at twice the rate of the rest of the UK. Unemployment over recent years has been uh, lower than the rest of the UK. We've got one of the most skilled populations in Europe, best universities uh, per head of population in the world. And contrary to uh, some of the comments that uh, Murdo Fraser was, uh, was making earlier, we actually attract significantly more people from the rest of the UK to come and work here than travel in the other direction. But of course, we've got challenges and there are many things that we need to do better. Um, and I just want to cover through some of the things that are covered in the, the programme for government around the theme of opportunity, uh, positive, and also I think where we need, to, we need to make sure that we deliver on the detail. But first, just to reflect on the reaction from business, which frankly has been um, welcomed. They, they welcomed the messaging very much so, but they've made the important caveat that they need to see the detail and they need to understand on the delivery. Um, and I know that the government recognises that, but as we... Uh, as often has been the case in the past, falling down on delivery um, is, uh, uh, doesn't um, uh, mean that we, we realise that, uh, that potential. Some specifics. Welcome the focus on the innovation strategy, but again, important to deliver on the specific actions in that, particularly around cluster building, cluster accreditation, and so on and so forth. The comments on regulation um, are, are, are hugely welcome. We understand cumulative impact. We understand the BRIA has to have teeth like I believe it had in the past. Um, so that really needs to be internalised in working with business as you know the government is to deliver on that. Skills and the labour market, hugely important issue for businesses in every sector. Um, it's important to include businesses at an early stage in the work in taking forward the Withers Review so that we don't lose the, 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 the needs that they have in that regard. Clearly, the childcare investment is, uh, is hugely welcome, but also important that capacity is in place to deliver on that. Um, and I welcome the, 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 the work that's been taken forward on talent attraction, but again, don't lose sight of UK talent attraction when we're focused also on international, uh, international opportunities there. The net zero investments are, uh, again, hugely important in, in terms of how we're going to deliver decarbonisation across, uh, across society, but making sure that's joined up so that we uh, make sure that that spend uh, and that procurement helps to drive and build the sectors within Scotland's economy and gives us an economic development boost as well. Um, and very important, of course, to take forward the work on attracting investment uh, into, uh, into the net zero sector. And I know the work uh, of Angus McPherson and the, the FM's investor panel will be reporting, and that is hugely important as part of this, uh, this drive. And that was a, a big topic of conversation last night at the Scottish Financial Enterprise event. And, of course, the need for the green industrial strategy. We've talked about that. Um, we know what a good strategy and in terms of format should look like. The sector absolutely is up for that and very keen to engage. So we need to get something there that isn't just sound bites uh, and aspirations, something that's got real actions, uh, evidence driven and can deliver on uh, that, uh, that potential uh, sooner rather than later. Um, I welcome the, the commitment to take forward green ports, but again, very important um, that we don't lose focus. And I, I know that the government won't on the fair work and real living wage commitments and conditionality that were secured that, uh, uh, during the negotiations with the UK government on, uh, on that initiative and, of course, rolling that out wider conditionality where we can, um, because that, of course, drives higher wages, which is, again, to the good of, uh, of the whole economy and not just uh, those individuals receiving those, uh, those wages. I was interested to see the call for the UK government um, uh, on, on the back of uh, Tom Hunter's uh, ask uh, with regards to corporation tax and focused reliefs, which I think is a much more grown-up and sensible strategy um, than blanket increases or blanket reductions because it allows us to build those clusters. And I don't know if this is the start of uh, Scottish Government positioning ourselves to how we will approach corporation tax and company law more general when we have those powers uh, as an independent country. And I think this is an interesting uh, first step in, uh, in that regard. Um, but finally, just to focus on delivery, um, which, as I say, is where we often fall down. NSET lays out what needs to be done, take that forward, I think, trying to uh, find the next shiny new thing or go off on a tangent because civil servants think thought of something else is not helpful. Stick to the, the, the knitting, stick to what's in NSET and deliver those, uh, those 77 actions. 
Um, agency reform is mentioned. I'm not quite sure where that's going. But again, my, my, uh, my comments there would be that uh, don't pull resources back to the centre or to government from agencies. Agencies deliver. Uh, the, 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 that, that's where the action happens. That's where the engagement with business is. That's what, uh, that, what's important, much more important, frankly, than what government is, uh, is doing in that, uh, in doing that space. Very important to streamline funding streams. Um, the, the plethora of what's out there is confusing and unhelpful for business. Um, business wants to uh, have uh, easy processes McKee, for interacting uh, with government and the agencies, and that shows the important, as is data sharing um, across that, uh, that part of the, uh, um, the, 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 the scope of the, the work of the government as well. Thank so you, Mr. a lot McKee. of good stuff there, I will have um, to ask but you a lot to, to focus on as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, General. Let's just clarify how much time I have for my speech. Six minutes. <laughs> Six minutes, Six is minutes. It? Six minutes. So that's and two is eight. Good. Um, so thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And uh, I am delighted to speak in this debate in what is a, a new portfolio for me. However, uh, members may or may not be comforted uh, by the fact that the topics, topics I wish to discuss remain very similar to the topics I've always discussed uh, and what I'm very passionate about. So uh, a similar message from a, from a different viewpoint. So I'll start by saying I think the biggest drag uh, on our economy is actually our very poor health record. We've only recently uh, heard that uh, the cost of obesity to Scotland, uh, Scotland's economy is now risen to £5 billion. Our mental health bill is now £4.5 billion. Pounds. We know that 10% of the NHS budget goes on diabetes and related conditions. So I would suggest that you know, while we're discussing the economy, it is really, really important we think across portfolio, and that portfolio, I think, is where we really need to start. And I've often said that I believe that education uh, is the solution to health and welfare, and that's something I really strongly believe in. And I think that when we're looking at our, our, our tackling our poor health record, I think the educational environment is somewhere where we need to be, keep our focus. And perhaps maybe... Of course. Cabinet Secretary. I, I look to um, pose the same question I posed to Murdo Fraser. Why have the IFS reported this morning that social mobility, education, plays such an important role? Social mobility in the UK is the worst for 50 years. Brian Whittle. I thank the, the Cabinet Secretary for his intervention. I, think, I, I noticed that he, 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 went the, he went to the UK. He didn't, he didn't compare it to it. Yes, but he didn't, he didn't break it up into where, where Scotland is. And I think our poor education, which has been on this slide since uh, the SNP came into power, is a huge, uh, is a huge implication in why our economy is, is sluggish. Maybe perhaps I will get the chance later on in this term to expand in these themes. However, while we're on education, uh, if we are to fully realise the opportunities available in Scotland, I think it's about time we started doing things like weaving the green economy and the blue economy and the rural economy into our education system. We need to link it with our business and our business need. We need to ensure that pupils understand the opportunities that are being created as we shift our economy towards net zero. We need engineers, we need tradespeople, we need software developers, we need environmental protection officers, I found out, which apparently we're very short of them too, and they are required to ensure that our food production is certified for use here and for export and so on. And we still haven't tackled the problem of women into STEM. There is a huge need here, and the Scottish Government, unfortunately, are guilty of very lazy politics. They're very good at publishing very impressive targets without the route map to get there, content with deflecting responsibility. I'm glad to see Patrick Harvey in, in the room today because he has come into this chamber and declared uh, boldly that one million homes will be retrofitted with heat pumps between 2025 and 2030 without the slightest idea of what that means in terms of workforce and cost. At a round table discussion with construction industry, they highlighted that to hit government 2030 targets, they need in excess of 22,500 tradespeople and engineers by 2028. Where are they going to get them from? And the Scottish Government have absolutely no idea. And that's before we get into the supply chain network to service this expansion. Now, I am all for ambitious stretch targets. Decide where you want to be and then map out how you're going to get there. But Scottish Government, these are your targets. These are your responsibility. But time and again, as each target is missed, the Scottish Government renege on that responsibility. You see, Presiding Officer, what is essential in the business world is to create the need that gives business the confidence to invest in and service that need. 
That gives confidence for those who are working in our oil and gas sector to retrain safe in the knowledge that it is an industry to go to that is safe, secure and growing. That is how you develop a just transition. The Scottish Government way is to announce a just transition and then just attack the Scottish oil and gas sector. It's all stick and no carrot, of course. Cabinet Secretary. Thanks to Brian Whittle for giving way. Just as he mentions uh, Scotland's climate targets, which are obviously driving a lot of what we need to do in heat decarbonisation, if I remind him that his party enthusiastically backed those targets, do I have his support to work with me constructively on what we need to do to realise them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brian Whittle. That would be a great if we had that opportunity for the Scottish Government to come and work with you, because yes, we do support the targets, and that's my point. I do support very ambitious targets, but there is no route map to get there. Yeah. We should be a world leader, for example, in green hydrogen, but once again, the government are going about it back to front. How about incentivising the really big energy users, heavy industry and goods vehicles or public transport to commit to that shift? End users that the green hydrogen industry can service. We have wind and solar to create the green hydrogen. Take it off the grid. That in turn encourages the private sector, who incidentally are desperate to shift investment to the green economy, to invest. Once we have that established economy, it can grow into other sectors and then into export opportunities. Instead, we have a Scottish Government who are tinkering around the edges, trying to create a hydrogen generation without considering how to develop the market. The same applies to heat pumps. I, sorry, I'm, I'm running out of time. The same applies to heat pumps. And if we're serious about net zero, uh, tackling uh, net zero and the biggest pollute, we should tackle the biggest polluters first off-grid oil-fired heating systems. It will be expensive as it requires significant insulation of the dwellings as well as underfloor heating system, but it creates the marketplace and the direction of travel as well as delivering against net zero targets in a positive and progressive way. I but, must ask you to conclude at this will, point, yeah, Mr Whittle. Scotland has economic opportunities, but for this Scottish Government, no, such opportunities are never grasped. Thank you. Officer. I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, I welcome this programme for government and the uh, ambitious announcements made by the First Minister this week. The total of 14 bills to be introduced, including just to name four, the education, land reform, housing and, social, and Scottish languages, can all have important outcomes for the country. Now, this programme for government is anti-poverty and pro-growth, which will certainly help deliver for every community across the country, including in my own Greenock and Inverclyde constituency. Now, one of the announcements I particularly welcome is the access to funded childcare to be expanded from nine months through to the end of primary school in early adopter communities within six councils, Inverclyde being one of them, Fife, Shetland, Glasgow, Clackmanisher and Dundee. Now, this policy will mean a further 13,000 additional children stand to benefit at the end of this parliamentary term. Now, this means another 13,000 children will have a greater opportunity to have the best start in their education journey. Now, John Swinney spoke very strongly about his commitment to the expansion of early years education and why it was so vital. Now, the announcements of the First Minister on Tuesday build upon that. The increase in the £12 per hour for social care staff and childcare staff is hugely important and will benefit my constituency, particularly as Inverclyde has a growing older population who are more likely to require social care support. And across the country, however, up to 100,000 people, the vast majority of whom are women, will benefit from this policy. Now, this may be seen as an opportunity for some people that never considered working in these sectors before. Now, the policy alone will see some staff earn more than an additional £2,000 on top of their current wages. Also, I, I sadly have a growing number of constituents contacting my office struggling, struggling with the cost of living crisis brought on by the, the Tories' obsession with Brexit and the disastrous trust quarting budget last September, a budget which wreaked havoc on the UK economy that was already struggling. Now, I, wonder, I wonder whether the Scottish Tories still stand by their calls for this, that this government, the Scottish Government, to actually follow suit uh, from that, that absolute folly last year. Also, my constituents want assistance, and I know that the £405 million being invested in the Scottish Child Payment this year, which will help over 300,000 children across the country, is welcome. In total, £5.3 billion will be invested in Social Security this year, and this is an investment in people. And I'm saying also, also uh, the, the Financial Times called the, the UK, uh, and I quote, a poor society with some very rich people. I mean, consider that the UK is actually uh, regarded as the fifth richest country in the world. That's a pretty damning indictment. 
Now, I'm not going to launch into a debate on the class politics, but I'm sure that I can speak for the vast majority of my constituents when I say that at no time should the majority of the population be left to struggle as the trickle-down economics continues to fail millions across Scotland and across the UK. Now, my constituents will be shocked. They will be shocked to learn that both London Labour and the branch office here in Scotland sold the jerseys when it comes to actually looking after people. Labour no longer want to scrap the bedroom tax. Labour no longer want to scrap the rape clause, but they actually somehow want to make it a bit fairer. And Labour no longer want to deliver a progressive taxation system so that those who can afford to pay more can pay more. And Labour no longer want to abolish the House of Lords. Instead, they want to stuff it full of more of their cronies. This so-called party of the working class have turned into a Tory party tribute act to try to win votes in England. Now, the SNP, however, have a, a record of delivery in our devolved parliament. With the, with the full powers of independence, we as a nation could achieve so much more. Uh, we also wouldn't be under the threat of the Westminster Internal Market Act, which any future UK government could use to limit the actions of this parliament and also of this government. Now, I welcome the, the closer working relationships with the business community, including the £50 million package to support enterprise and entrepreneurship. Now, this will create new opportunities to start, scale and sustain businesses. And along with the Scottish Government's green industrial and energy strategies, will ensure that businesses maximise the opportunities of a just transition to net zero. Now, I also look forward to the, the publication of the Addressing Depopulation Action Plan. Now, during the summer recess, uh, uh, quite a number of ministers come to visit the Green and Brooklyn constituency, for which I am very grateful for. Uh, and uh, I did have a, one meeting with uh, the Minister Emma Roddick to discuss Inverclyde's acute uh, depopulation challenges. Now, losing over 30,000 people since 1979 is always going to be a challenge, but with an older population and a growing older population placing more challenges on local public services, we have a need, but also an opportunity to do something to help turn that around. Now, once again, however, the, the dead hand of Westminster isn't helping with immigration powers reserved to Westminster. Now, once upon a time, once upon a time, even the Labour Party supported this Parliament acting to try to address population decline with Lord Jack McConnell's Fresh Talent Initiative. Sadly, it was the UK Labour Party who scrapped this policy in 2008 when it introduced a points-based system and thus got rid of a limited approach that actually was helping Scotland. Now, as Labour are now a pro-Brexit party, they see no opportunity for Scotland to deliver policies to help our population challenge, which is even greater now than it was when they were last in power in this Parliament. Now, I welcome the announcement about the Bill on Scottish Languages. Languages are hugely important to our culture and our community, and working to not only preserve but also grow our languages shows a respect for our past. But it's also an opportunity for more people to engage with our culture and traditions, and this clearly will have economic benefits across the country. Signing officer, I'm going to close, but I just want to say I uh, generally am pleased about this programme for government. It's got solid measures that certainly will provide a wide range of opportunities for, my, for Scotland, but also my own constituents in Greenock and Inverclyde. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Pam Duncan Glancy to be followed by Jim Fairley. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm in Parliament because I believe Scotland can be a land of opportunity for all, where everyone, no matter their background, can fulfil their potential. But I'm also here because I know that it can only be that land of opportunity if we make it so. It doesn't happen by accident. For too many, opportunities are few and inequality is the default. That won't just fix itself. We have to fix that by design. It has long been my view that key to delivering that fix and the leveller for that inequality and lack of opportunity is education. When done well, it can break down inequalities, open opportunities and shatter the glass, class or step ceiling in its way. From the earliest years of a young person's life, education begins to build the blocks of a future opportunity. And when it's valued and nourished, it can do this through all life, in school, where we learn about the world around us, in college and university, where we learn to live and work in it, and even in the workplace or our community, where we learn to apply it. The opportunities education brings are endless. That's why I was so disappointed that on education, the programme for government was full of re-announced pledges and vague intent. From the earliest years, children are shut out of opportunity and families are being held back. I and my party welcome the announcement from government on wraparound childcare. 
when it was first announced, and I welcome it again this week. But I also recognise that it is not new and still falls short of addressing the barriers so many face. The recent Audit Scotland report found poorer people are less likely to take up funded childcare because it's inflexible around the types of jobs they're in. Wraparound childcare has to wrap around hospitality and shift workers too. And recent reports find a decline in the private and voluntary childcare sector, where flexibility is often found. We need clarity on how the government will address that. A digital platform, or let's call a spade a spade, a website, is like an offer from the 90s and will not address the structural issues underpinning the sector. Presiding officer, school is a place where opportunity is a plenty. But just now, children and staff don't feel safe there. Most young people go to school to learn, see friends and to socialise, but there is a rise in violent incidents and it is detracting from that. Those incidents are few, but they are the canary in the coal mine that the government has lost control over education. The increase in lower level poor behaviour shows that anger and anxiety is bubbling under the surface. Classrooms are like pressure cookers. Families are struggling to make ends meet and the promised free school meals rollout that was is now delayed by another two years in this programme for government. It's not too late though to turn this round, but only if the government acts fast, listens to parents, pupils and trade unions and releases the pressures they're all under. That has to start with the SNP Green government at least coming good on their promises on free school meals, smaller class sizes and increased non-contact time for teachers. It's a huge disappointment that... I'll take the intervention here. Thank you. I'm, I'm grateful to Pam Duncan Glancy for taking an intervention. And as she rightly mentions the pressures that are bearing down on families, I wonder if she supports the two-child cap the rape clause, the bedroom tax, and if she doesn't, which I suspect she doesn't, will she call on and ask Sarwar and Keir Starmer to drop them because their position appears to be that they do support these? Pam Duncan Glancy. I, 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 I thank the Minister for, for that intervention, but I think she's aware that Anas Sarwa has already said that we will do all we can to ensure that universal credit and all its failings, including the two-child limit, is improved, reformed and delivers for people all across the UK, not just here in Scotland. I cannot also express enough my disappointment that there is no mention of a transition strategy for young disabled people in this programme for government. A transition strategy was first promised in the SNP 2016 manifesto. Eight years later, we're still waiting. We cannot leave the futures of young disabled people to the whim of one government for one government or the next. And so I ask members across the chamber to support my bill to make sure this doesn't happen and give young disabled people the fighting chance they deserve. And speaking of a fighting chance, our colleges and unis need them too, as Willie Rennie has already highlighted. The further and higher education sector is built for opportunity. It's what they're there to do. But they're crying out for help and they're not getting it. They got a, flash, a flat cash settlement, a cut. And then the first thing the new minister did was whip away the promised 46 million the government promised them. The only thing worse than not having enough money in the first place is thinking you've got it, planning to use it, and then having it snatched away. Lecturers were outside today telling us about the real impact of that. Their jobs are on the line. When asked to step into the fiasco, for example, in the city of Glasgow College, the minister has acted like a commentator, not the person where the buck stops. Universities are burst too, losing out on core research funding and desperately trying to plug the gaps in funding left by the government under funding places. And we're still waiting on a replacement for Erasmus, three years after it was promised. In that time, the Welsh Labour government has developed a scheme which has had 6,000 exchanges with 95 countries. Yet this government can't tell us what model they'll use or at what cost, far less get any students going abroad. Presiding officer, this week's programme for government was a chance to fix all of this. Scotland can be a land of opportunity and an excellent education system has the potential to level the playing field. But we need a government that's serious about it. It really is time for change. Yeah. I know that. We know that. People out there know that. And I believe the government know that too. It's time to bring back hope, tear down the barriers that create inequality. And that starts by fixing our crumbling education system. By investing in education, not just making big promises, but delivering them. And by smashing the glass, class and stared ceilings to opportunity that too many people face, Scottish Labour can bring opportunity to Scotland for all. And I believe we will. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Jim Fairley to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. 
Uh, President Officer, Ivan Key gave an excellent appraisal of some of the real positives in our economy, as well as some of the challenges. But last week's Fraser of Allender poll around Scottish business attitudes to the Scottish Government relationship with business undoubtedly made for uncomfortable reading. And I'm pretty sure that the Government would also have been very aware of the fact that as a party in a Government, we needed a reset to have a reset with the business community to regain the trust and belief that this party has enjoyed over many, many years. Now, I know from my own experience of running my business prior to coming into this place, whether it was the farming element or the catering and food element, that the SNP were there for those industries and did everything in its power to help us to be as successful as we possibly could. And I've mentioned it many times before in this chamber, but the national food and drink policy introduced by Richard Lockhead in 2008 was an absolute game changer in terms of the relationship and confidence that the industry took from the government, the positivity, and it was hugely instrumental in driving the big ambition and the success of that industry. And I've had many conversations over the years with Richard Lockhead and John Swinney on many aspects of how business was faring at any particular time, and I was always confident that I was being heard and the issues that I raised were being seen as legitimate and worthy of further consideration, even if all of those ideas didn't actually get implemented. And I have to say, and with all due respect, my experience of dealing with Ross Finney and his role during the Lib Dem Labour years was not nearly so constructive, despite the fact that he was a very nice person to talk to. And it's perhaps for that reason that I found the poll so disturbing last week, because I always regard the SNP as being the party for all the people of Scotland, including the huge array of immensely talented and dynamic SMEs that make up over 80% of Scotland's business community. Having their trust is vital if we're going to continue a party for all that is recognised as being a force for good, a force for ambition, for aspiration and for entrepreneurial endeavour, because that's the party I vote for, that I campaign for, and I stood as a candidate to represent in this place so that we can continue to represent and improve the lives of our people, our businesses, and be the good international neighbours that we want to be. One of the things that gives this party the respect and the trust of the business community and all our citizens is the level of engagement we have with the people we represent. Whether it is businesses, communities, group industries, groups, industry bodies and third sector organisations, these voices are heard and understood. And what's more, they all know that they are heard and understood. Mm -hmm. and the rationale of those early years made absolute sense then and it still makes sense now. So I was very heartened by the programme of government content, content and the focus on engagement. When we read the responses that have emanated as a result of the First Minister's statement on Tuesday, it would be interesting to see now how the Fraser of Allender survey would read if it was being conducted today. Because it's a programme for government that makes sense by tying the aim of tackling poverty with growing the economy while encouraging entrepreneurship that Scotland is famed for, while having the regulatory burdens that businesses currently face and business organisations are welcoming the approach. The Food and Drink Federation Scotland Chief Executive Officer David Thompson said, it is positive to see the First Minister's commitment to work with the Scottish business to remove regulations that are no longer required and to ensure that they are involved at the early stage of policy development. The establishment of a small business unit is welcome. It is vital that our food and drink manufacturers are represented in this work to ensure that their views are heard. The Scotland Policy Chair Andrew McRae said, in efforts to boost start-up, start-ups need to see some of the practical barriers to setting up and business removed. This includes childcare, so we welcome the announcement of much needed additional support there. He went on to say, we are pleased to hear him re recommit to a specific small business unit and a commitment to tackling the cumulative impact of regulations, including removing those which are no longer required. From the Scottish Chamber of Commerce, turning to our critical friend Liz Cameron, she said this, which I think kind of highlights the point that I made at the start of my contribution. Is government on the side of business? That's the question at the forefront of the business community. There is much in today's announcement that businesses will welcome, particularly the essential focus on inward investment and exporting. On the labour market, she said, businesses will welcome the government prioritising childcare as a way of supporting households and enabling participation in the labour market. The development of a new funding model for post-school education provision is welcomed for improving lifelong learning. This must be balanced with widening access to training and skills across all pathways. The Scottish Council for Development and Industry said, We support the focus on creating a well-being economy, on economic growth and investment in childcare, which is key to enabling more people to access meaningful work. 
Implementation of the new deal for business recommendations will contribute to regaining the trust of Scottish businesses and strengthen the partnerships needed to unlock sustainable and inclusive growth. These are the thoughts of just some of the businesses and organisations, but that positivity is replicated across all sectors, from developing the green economy to tackling poverty and beyond. This motion is about the opportunities, and I am excited and delighted to back this Government's motion as we move ever more steadily towards being an independent country again. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Mark Ruskell to be followed by Pam Gossel. Thank you. This summer we've seen across Europe some of the most extreme weather events in history. And it is clear, I think, to all of us that we do need deeper, faster action to tackle both the climate and nature emergencies. But I think that's starting to come through now with the work of this government and in, in, in particular this programme for government and I think the forthcoming climate change plan. I mean, today's launch by my colleague Lorna Slater of the Biodiversity Strategy and Delivery Plan, for example, will unlock huge investment in our land and seas not seen in generations, while the heat and building strategy led by my other colleague Patrick Harvey will address the vast scale of change needed to make homes warmer, cheaper and low carbon. And I listened to some of the criticisms earlier from um, Brian Whittle, but effectively what he's doing is describing an, an enormous economic opportunity as a problem. But what he fails to grasp is that it is the role of governments, it is the role of governments to create new markets to send clear signals to industry that there are markets that are investable and that can drive progress. And that is exactly what this government is doing. And to be honest, who would not want to invest in the heat pump market across the UK at the moment? Because it's clear that it's going to have an incredibly strong future. But, you know, there is a need for a, a let's say, a wider political reset involving all parties, especially after the, the wobble that we saw on climate policies across the political spectrum this summer. So I am really pleased that the First Minister has shown leadership and answered my call for a climate summit to allow us all to address challenges and opportunities together. Climate leadership and the desire for change is also building in our own communities. So I also welcome this programme for government, the commitment to roll out climate action hubs, helping communities to lead the change themselves, building up action programmes in areas like home energy advice. We know that a just and fair energy transition is critical to Scotland's economic future. Offshore and onshore wind energy and solar power will be needed to supercharge our transition, provide secure green jobs, and make Scotland a powerhouse of Europe's green revolution. But I want to highlight the role of onshore wind, because what has been achieved so far in Scotland has been truly remarkable. We've seen a doubling of renewable capacity in the last decade, led by onshore wind. But of course that needs to double again to meet our growing needs to electrify transport, heating and to urgently decarbonise industry. But sadly projects have been stifled by long waiting times for consents while modern more efficient turbines have faced unnecessary planning hurdles. So a new sector deal for onshore wind is very welcome. It will help to speed up the consent process and deliver more critical certainty for business. But of course, it, it is a two-way street. Where industry delivers economic growth, it should have a responsibility to share in the rewards with communities that host developments. And the wind industry also has a responsibility to work with government to deliver those supply chain opportunities, to deliver the skills, and to deliver the new jobs. We need that critical partnership. And the onshore wind sector deal will match the ambition with action working in partnership with business to drive Scotland forward to net zero. But I'd like to contrast that with the anti-science, anti-green business position of the Westminster government, who have effectively banned onshore wind farms in England now for a decade. I mean, only two wind turbines were installed in England last year. That is an absolute disgrace. And it's wildly out of step with public opinion as well. You've got young people in England who should have been leaving college and university to start jobs in the wind industry over the last decade, but they've had their career dreams destroyed by the actions of the Westminster government. The decisions made today don't just affect current jobs, they affect future ones as well. So, you know, going forward this year, we won't be taking lectures from the Tories about oil and gas because 
While they scaremonger about turning off the taps and mass job losses, the reality is that this SNP Green Government values every dedicated worker in the oil and gas industry. And we will not leave any oil and gas worker behind in this just transition. But given that nearly a quarter of our climate emissions now come from industry, that rapid and just transition needs to happen now across all industrial sectors. And sites like Moss Moran, for example, in Fife in my region, offer exciting opportunities for workers and the local community. But we need to get everybody around the table to achieve the just transition and to do it fast. So I welcome the progress that the government's made around Grangemouth, working with industry and the just transition plan there. But I would say that, you know, Moss Moran represents 10% of Scotland's climate emissions. And then you've got the cement works at Dunbar, another point source industrial emissions that with the right partnership approach could be delivering change and decarbonisation. As the Secretary General of the UN said, you know, with climate, we need to be doing everything everywhere and all at once. You know, we can't afford to hold back on progress. So, you know, I'll be, I'll be looking critically at the green industrial strategy and the work the government's doing in the run-up to next summer. We need to move quickly on all these opportunities. But, Presiding Officer, in closing, you know, this is a programme for government that does double down on that urgent action that's needed to tackle the climate and nature crises, while at the same time delivering that fair and prosperous economy that everybody deserves. And I do urge all members, if you can, to unite behind it. Thank you. And I call Pam Gossel to be followed by Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to support the amendment in the name of my colleague, Marjorie Fraser. I also welcome the language in the programme for government around economic growth. And I welcome that on Tuesday, the First Minister emphasised the need to work closely with local government partners to develop the local infrastructure and services required to deliver his pledges. However, I am disappointed to see no mention of the importance of local government in the government motion today. But this is perhaps not surprising when you consider the poor relationship that the Scottish Government has maintained with councils over the last 16 years. Local government in Scotland is all about making a difference right here in our own backyard. It's about ensuring our voices are heard, our needs are met and our communities thrive. But it has been difficult for local government to deliver on these roles when it has been placed under such intense financial pressure over the last decade. Uh, I have decided not to take any interventions. Why? Because the last three days we have been hearing from these benches and it's about time now the SNP and Greens government listen. And that's yeah. something that's not a strong point because we know from the short term um, let groups and individuals outside that the Scottish government refused to listen. So I'll carry on. Councils find they are constantly being asked to do more with less. Just to highlight, the Scottish Government budget has gone up by 8.3% since 2014. But the local government budget has not seen a remotely similar uplift. The SNP often pass the buck on to councils by forcing them to make difficult decisions about which services to cut or which taxes to raise. Recent warnings highlight that some local authorities may not even have the funds to provide statutory services will come as no surprise to many, as councils are set to make £300 million cuts this year. But this, but this needs to change. If local government are expected to help develop infrastructure and provide more services and help drive growth across the country, the Scottish Conservatives have long been calling for councils to have more financial flexibility. So we welcome the intention of the New Deal to do just that. However, without addressing the chronic underfunding of councils, this New Deal is merely a reshuffling of the deck chairs. In an attempt to improve public finances, the SNP are now floating around options to make households poorer by increasing council tax by up to 22.5% for around 750,000 households. Instead, the Scottish Government should be encouraging local government to create growth 
and encourage productivity within its locality. My colleague Liz Smith set out earlier this week, we desperately need a tax structure that encourages productivity and boosts revenue, thus creating better public services, not one that punishes ambition and enterprise, Scotland, under the SNP, is already the highest tax part of the United Kingdom. This shows that tax increases don't believe better public services. Instead, we need to see local government handed the power to drive growth. Let's give councils more control over the levers that can drive growth, as Douglas Ross called for in our recent paper grasping the thistle. Measures like this are a surefire way to create more thriving communities. In conclusion, presiding officer, there is so much potential growth that can come from a reset in relations between local and national government. But to deliver on this potential, we need to see a structure of our tax system, a, re sorry, a restructure of our tax system, a focus on growing the economy and the tax base, and we need to give local government the opportunity to create growth and productivity. Thank you. And I call Audrey Nicholl, the final speaker in the open debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I too welcome the opportunity to speak in this, the final debate on the new programme for government. The wide-ranging measures outlined in the programme will reach our children through policies such as the Scottish Child Payment and the expansion of childcare provision. Our young people, by taking action on the serious harm caused by single-use vapes, support or for the supporting traction for our renewable sector. And while the UK government continues to squeeze the life out of human rights protections, the Scottish Government works towards the introduction of a human rights bill. All timeous and all much needed to mitigate the impact of the agents of chaos, known as the, Scottish, as the UK Government, enabled by a sleepwalking Labour Party. Today's motion focuses on the opportunities the programme for government provides to grow an economy that has well-being at its heart. And while the notion of a well-being economy is a bit of a stretch for some, I am particularly drawn to the principle of building an economic system that operates within safe environmental limits and where success shifts beyond just GDP growth to delivering shared well-being for generations to come. Central to our transition to a well-being economy is business, a vehicle for innovation with the potential to accelerate positive impact with its partners, communities and governments. And for me, this was brought to life earlier this year at an event here in the Scottish Parliament. And I listened to a young entrepreneur describe the opportunity that COVID presented to him to shift his business practice to one that was underpinned by well-being principles. And he was happier, more fulfilled and more successful. And I spent much of the summer recess visiting many businesses in my constituency. For some, business is thankfully buoyant, but for others, they are struggling to cover their costs. Fabulous small businesses losing heart. So I very much welcome the First Minister's commitment to develop a new and stronger relationship with business and to implement the recommendations made by the New Deal for Business Group. And in that regard, I would ask the Scottish Government to ensure there is a genuine commitment to the recommendation concerning the review of non-domestic rates policy reform. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's update uh, around non-domestic rates earlier, uh, as this was a common theme raised with me. Turning to the First Minister's announcement regarding a green industrial strategy, from my conversations with industry representatives over the last 
couple of days, they recognise the limited powers the Scottish Government has at its disposal, but have expressed considerable optimism regarding the strategy. And they're also particularly welcoming of the changes announced to the consenting process for renewables <laughs> technologies, having raised the issue of consenting timescales for offshore wind projects in this chamber many times, I know that this will be very welcome across the sector. And I know Scottish Renewables have also welcomed the Scottish Government commitment to its energy strategy and just transition plan in order that Scotland reaps the maximum possible benefit of a move to a clean energy system. I welcome this commitment and as a North East constituency MSP, I have regular conversations with renewables businesses keen to move their investment and development opportunities forward in a space where nothing happens in isolation and many moving parts must align in order to support meaningful progress. And one of these uh, moving parts uh, is skills, which has been uh, highlighted to uh, a, a extensive degree this afternoon in the chamber and again from my conversations with uh, industry there are challenges across the renewable sector that we are all grappling with in terms of the development of our workforce of tomorrow and I again I welcome the uh, contribution uh, or the uh, update uh, given by the Cabinet Secretary around the talent attraction and migration uh, plan uh, and also the uh, investment unit and I'll be very keen to hear a, a bit more about that. And of course the North East hosts a huge breadth of creative work to develop our workforce both within our fantastic further and higher education institutions, centres such as the Net Zero Technology Centre and within industry itself. And I recently visited the new Hydrosun Skills Academy uh, in my constituency and heard about their plans to offer courses to make uh, people, uh, to support people making a skills transition. However, only this morning I spoke with a North East uh, Renewables company who are struggling to recruit a project manager. So again, I'm very keen um, that the Scottish Government ensures skills development uh, and workforce planning uh, is front and centre of our uh, energy strategy and just transition plan going forward. So I want to uh, conclude my contribution by welcoming the commitment to the £15 million plan to support the implementation of Mark Logan's review of our technology ecosystem and the development of a blueprint to make our colleges and universities stronger bases for entrepreneurs. And I've recently been engaging with the Net Zero Technology Centre in Aberdeen regarding their ambition to develop an enhanced uh, clean energy tech X acceleration programme as part of an energy transition uh, cluster and I welcome the cabinet secretary's recent um, positive response to my invitation uh, to consider opportunities around this. So to conclude presiding officer I welcome the programme for government and I would urge all members to support the government motion. Thank you. Thank you. We move to winding up and I call on Rhoda Grant up to six minutes please. Thank you presiding officer and before I turn um, to the content of the debate. I want to raise something else that I'd hoped would be ra raised in debate, and that's land reform, because it provides very clear opportunity to Scotland. The First Minister, in his programme for government, to talked about bold and radical land reform, but lacked a vision for that, because just 0.027% of Scottish, Scotland's population own 67% of Scotland's land and that shows how much power and wealth is held in such few hands. Donald Dewar in his McEwan's lecture in 1998 said land reform was not a one-off event and indeed the Jimmy Reid Foundation's paper on land reform by Callum McLeod really illustrated that so it looked at the history but it also um, pushed for a radical approach to land reform. And the Scottish Government have said that they'll introduce a public interest test when land changes hands. But the 3,000 hectare trigger is timid and it means that virtually no land holdings in Scotland will ever face a public interest test. The community right to buy is unworkable. There's far too many hurdles and it needs to be updated. And that could create huge opportunities for our communities. 
The Community Empowerment Act sought to put urban communities on the same footing as rural communities, but they won't receive a public interest test. So that's really important that that happens because our towns and city centres are absolutely blighted at the moment and they need to have the same powers within their communities. People like Peter Peacock and Mike Russell, who were previous MSPs, previous Cabinet Secretaries, joined forces this summer calling for a radical approach. And they were backing Mercedes Villalba's um, 500 hectares uh, ceiling plan to have a, a, a um, public interest test implemented. And that's also been um, backed by other organisations such as Community Land Scotland, the Jimmy Reid Foundation, which I talked about. And they're both offering support for such policies, but also solutions to our land ownership issues. Just briefly. Myrtle Fraser. I'm grateful to Rudy Grant for giving away. Can you just confirm, is that now Scottish Labour policy not to allow any land holdings above 500 hectares? Rosa Grant. We are consulting on that. And it has to be very clear that there will be a public interest test involved. So if it's in the public interest that larger parcels of lands would change hands, then of course that would be the case. But if it's not in the public interest, where that is very often the case, then we would be looking to make sure that that does not happen and provide a dead hand on communities, both rural and urban. Can I turn to the larger debate um, and uh, echo points made by my colleague Daniel Johnston, who welcomed the pay rise for care workers. But he was very clear that this is three years too late. Had they received this three years ago, they would be indeed much better paid just now. And another thing that slightly confuses me out of the First Minister's statement was he talked about that pay rise being for directly paid care workers. We want to see all care workers receive the £12 an hour and that that be increased to £15 an hour. And it's absolutely affordable because we are wasting huge amounts of money on agency workers. That's lining the pockets of the agencies and providing care workers with twice as much as they would receive anywhere else. Jim Fairley talked about childcare and its importance, and that was echoed, of course, by the Scottish Chamber of Commerce. And we agree that that is hugely important. But how is it going to be delivered? Because in rural areas, people have that right already, but they can't access any childcare, which means rural areas lose out on childcare, they lose out on homes, and they lose out of jo on jobs because of that. Can I turn as well to jobs and skills as raised by Daniel Johnston um, in his uh, speech and the importance of skilling young people to be able to take up the jobs uh, available, but not just young people. We need to skill um, older people. We need, if we're going to have a just transition, we need to make sure that everyone is skilled to take up the jobs on hand. And Pam Duncan Glancy talked about education and the importance that has of raising people out of poverty and talked about the, the opportunities we are missing, the promises for free school meals, the promises on class sizes, the promises on the Erasmus programme, all of which our people are missing out on. The Scottish Labour Party is committed to having UK energy, which will look at how we deal with our energy supply and also look at things like the supply chain that Willie Rennie talked about, um, that we're missing out on Scotland, um, and green hydrogen as well that Brian Whittle talked about. Um, presiding officer, um, just in conclusion, you know, this SNP's programme for government is of contracting ambition, not expanding ambition. Look at the A9, the A96. Ivan McKee even highlighted that about the lack of delivery. The Scottish Labour Party have a vision to transform Scotland and will grasp every single opportunity to do this. We'll pay care workers the fair rate for the job and we'll tackle climate change and create a public energy company if you headquartered could conclude, please, in Scotland Ms. Grant. and we'll stay true to Donald Dewar's vision to bring greater diversity to land ownership. Thank you. And I call on Douglas Lumsden up to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I welcome this debate on the programme for government and the opportunities that are before us in Scotland. 
Uh, we've had many good contributions to the debate, and I hope that the Cabinet Secretary is listening to some of the concerns heard here today um, from stakeholders, many of whom I've met over the last couple of months. Indeed, yesterday I attended offshore Europe in Aberdeen, where I met oil and gas workers and leaders increasingly concerned by the lack of interest from this SNP Green devolved government in the sector. Not one mention of oil and gas in the programme for government, and only a passing reference in the First Minister's speech. And the main message I took away from the conference, and I want to convey to the government, is that the hostility to the oil and gas sector is harming the supply chain the most. Larger en energy companies are choosing to invest in other areas around the world, and this is having a knock-on effect to the supply chain, and it's that supply chain that is vital for our transition. We can't have a just transition from oil and gas to renewables if we kill off that supply chain. Only the Scottish Conservatives are standing up for the oil and gas sector in the northeast of Scotland, and the oil and gas sector know it. I will give way to Kevin Stewart. Kevin Stewart. Mr Lumsden, um, I think, paints a picture which is entirely wrong. Now, we recognise uh, that the current uh, Conservative mantra is drill, baby, drill. But what we want to do is to ensure that we have that just transition. We create green jobs, recognise that we will still need oil and gas into the future. And I share the First Minister's ambition of making Aberdeen the world's global renewable energy capital. I wish he had that positivity. Douglas Lumsden. Well, what, what Kevin Stewart would have learned if he went to offshore Europe, I, I'm not sure if he did or not, but the actions that this government are taking are killing off the energy industry in Aberdeen. Without, an oil, without a supply chain, there will be no transition, and that is the path that they are going down. President Officer, this programme for government could have been titled a failure of government, given the number of broken promises it represents. A failure to duel the A9 or set a timetable for the work to be completed. A failure to duel the A96. A failure to eliminate the attainment gap. A failure to build ferries. A failure to protect our rural communities and a failure to grow our economy in line with the rest of the UK. I could go on, but time is limited, President Officer. My colleagues today have highlighted just some Mr. of the impacts that Mr. these Lumsden, failures could, have met for our communities. If you communities. could give me a moment. I am hearing comments, some of which are certainly discourteous, and being shouted across the chamber, and I would ask members to cease. Mr Lumsden. Thank you, President Officer. Maybe they don't like what they're hearing. We've heard, I'll turn to some of the comments that have been made in the debate today. Pam Gossel was right to highlight that local government is not mentioned in the government motion today. Local government is at the heart of our communities, but are often treated badly by this government. Stop the cuts should be the slogan for this programme for governance. No, I won't. Stop cutting libraries, stop cutting sport facilities, stop cutting vital services. They talk about early intervention and prevention, but these savage cuts to local government is making things worse. And that was a point that Brian Whittle also makes. Less public sport facilities will mean more obesity and more cost to our NHS. Daniel Johnson was right to say economic data is stark. We are lagging behind. VAT registered businesses are down. Job creation down. Willie Rennie described the programme as uninspiring, and I completely agree. But the most important point I think he made was no clarity to farmers on climate targets, and that must come urgently. As Murdo Fraser highlights, the Scottish Conservatives are the only party who are offering a clear vision for the economic future of Scotland within a strong United Kingdom, a United Kingdom that has recovered faster than any other European nation following COVID and with strong growth. The First Minister said this week that they are pro-growth, and yet we know that our wagon-tail coalition partners are anti-growth. The Scottish public are under no illusions about who is pulling the strings, and they know that it is independence that is top of their agenda and not the well-being and livelihoods of hard-working Scots. The programme for government is not ambitious. It's not forward-thinking. It does not offer solutions. It does not even offer a vision for Scotland. It only offers some mitigation for 16 years of an SNP government. Last week, the Scottish Conservatives set out their vision for the future of Scotland, 
a vision where we work in hand with the UK Government to deliver economic growth for our country, deliver a national workforce plan to align skills to our educational opportunities. We put emphasis on lifelong learning and work with partners to provide more rural housing in areas facing depopulation. We will tackle long-term health, including setting up a network of long COVID clinics, an issue that this government has failed to address. We will review business taxation to ensure it's fair and flexible and build a network of regional clusters of excellence to build international excellence in goods and services. This is how we will lift people out of poverty caused by the failures of this SNP government. This is a vision for Scotland, but instead we have the same old tired and worn out rhetoric of a First Minister who has no ideas, no vision, and is just a poor imitation of what went before. The continu continuity candidate who offers a government continuous in its failure to address the needs of Scottish business, Scottish schools and our health service. A government that fails to listen to the concerns expressed by businesses up and down Scotland, whether that's our drinks industry or our short-term lets industry. A government that is lacking in ideas and vision and can only ever prioritise independence to the detriment of everything else. Presiding officer, what we have seen over the last few days has shown the SNP Green Government to be failing in its duty to serve the people of Scotland, to work with the UK Government to bring investment and support our business sector, failed in its duty to deliver for our children and young people through better education and closing the attainment gap, failed in its duty to deliver world-class health care with one in seven Scots on an NHS waiting list. This programme for government does nothing to address these failures and the people of Scotland deserve better. Thank you, President. Officer. Thank you. And I call on Mary McAllen to wind up up to nine minutes. Cabinet Thank Secretary. you, President Officer. Um, left wondering where on earth Douglas Lumsden summons the negativity yeah. uh, to deliver yeah. such a closing speech. Um, we've had a very wide-ranging debate today, and I absolutely welcome the breadth of topics that have been covered. But as Net Zero Secretary, uh, I'm going to make no apology for opening my remarks by covering the twin crises of climate change and biodiversity loss, which are global challenges of existential proportion. And I believe that tackling them is the fight of our generation and generations to come. And of course, as I think Mark Ruskell reflected on, this challenge is not remote, it's, it's not far off. July this year has now been confirmed as the hottest month in global records. It's likely that 2023 will later be confirmed as the hottest year ever recorded. And all of this is happening while scientists label a marine heat wave currently circling the UK and Ireland as extreme. And of course, we are seeing the devastating impacts of these matters. In recent times alone, a third of Pakistan submerged in flood water with all the associated loss and damage. And that wild drought has uh, ripped across the Horn of Africa, spreading acute hunger. Cyclones are devastating Malawi and fires are ripping through Hawaii. Last year, in fact, in a discussion with um, international colleagues, I heard of how low-lying nations are now creating digital backups of their entire existence and culture for fear that one day they won't exist. Wow. And, presiding officer, the injustice at the heart of climate change is that it's these communities who've done so little to uh, contribute to the industrial processes that have caused climatic breakdown, but they're suffering from it first and worst. And that's why I'm very proud I will in a second, I, yes, absolutely. That's why I'm very proud of this programme for government's commitment on a delivery to our Just Communities programme, which will support resilience at a community level in our partner countries. And it's why this government will advocate for concrete progress on loss and damage at COP28. And I very much look forward to discussing these matters at the summit the First Minister and I will host uh, with key stakeholders in advance of COP28. And I'll give way to Daniel Johnson. Daniel Johnson. The, the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. And, uh, and forgive me for making a somewhat esoteric point, but we need to reflect on the privilege and advantage we have living at the la degree of latitude we do and in a maritime climate. And in the future, we're going to have to think about that inequality and how we actually honour that as we think about the challenges that people in the countries that she mentions. And I just wonder if she thinks that, that we all should reflect on that. Cabinet Secretary. Absolutely. I, I mean, please forgive me if I'm wrong. I hope Daniel Johnson wasn't suggesting that we ought to focus more on the issues at home. No. No, absolutely. And it is a broader point. And I was just going to go on to say that as we, as Scotland positions itself as a leader in, in international 
climate justice. We are also determinedly leading action at home to tackle climate change and restore nature here, uh, not least through our cornerstone programme for government commitment to a climate change plan, which will look right across our economy and society with bold action in transport, heat, industry, our natural environment and more, and set a pathway to take Scotland through its uh, global, uh, sorry, its um, climate targets, which I would remind the Chamber are still world leading and which every single party in the Parliament voted yeah. for. And I look forward to their cooperation yeah. in the actions yeah. that we have to take to meet, to meet the them. Yeah. I absolutely will give way to yeah. Brian Whistle. Brian Whistle. To meet the end. I'm very grateful uh, uh, from a colleague for giving way, and, and we do accept that the, the you have world-leading targets. The problem is you keep missing them, and every time you keep missing them, it means our, uh, it means our contribution to keeping it below 1.5 is missing. You can't have a target if you don't have a route map to get there. Through the chair always, Mr Whittle. Cabinet In that Secretary. regard, I look forward to Brian Whittle's enthusiastic Absolutely. support of this government's uh, heat decarbonisation yeah. programme when we bring that forward. I look forward to it. But, presiding officer, that's challenge covered. But where there is challenge, there is opportunity. Tackling the climate and nature emergencies is a moral and environmental imperative but it's also one of the most significant economic opportunities that Scotland has in front of it. Uh, sc opportunities, frankly, that, that other uh, countries would dearly love to have, and opportunities that this government is determined to seize. Yep. And I do want to come back to those, if I can, uh, conscious of time, but just before I do, I want to focus a little bit on that interconnectedness of climate change uh, and economic posterity, because just as uh, the summer was punctuated with horrific scenes of fires, floods and droughts across the world. So it was, almost side by side in the front pages of some papers, we saw the unedifying spectacle of the Tories and Labour almost competing to ditch yeah. their yeah. climate yeah. commitments. Yeah. Now, admittedly, the UK government are starting from a low base. I think that's yeah. perfectly yeah. summed up by their perverse opposition Let's hear the cabinet secretary. their perverse opposition to onshore wind on the one hand whilst they literally fight to open coal mines uh, yeah. on the other um, and of course their, their complete failure to compete with the US and the Inflation Reduction Act um, and it's why I think the Scottish Tories have stood in the way of so many of the projects that we've tried to bring forward in this parliament from recycling schemes through low emission zones to new heating standards so we may expect it from them but it was Labour who've been shape-shifting and flip-flopping, and I take yeah. no pleasure in watching it happen. Yeah. This summer, as pictures of climactic breakdown all around the world filled our screens, of people losing everything, up to and including their lives, almost side by side with that, we saw Keir Starmer and his branch office colleagues in Scotland yeah. lining up to systematically yeah, abandon absolutely. what were once their climate Cabinet Secretary, commitments. if you could just give me a moment. I'm aware of conversations going on across the chamber. I'd be grateful if members could treat one another with courtesy and respect. Cabinet Secretary. Interventions if they want to debate. Um, this is the same Labour Party who have recently confirmed they now support the bedroom tax, they won't scrap the rape clause, and they are wishing to emulate Tory fiscal regimes, gladly. Sarah Boyack. Did you add that one into the line? Sarah Boyack. The, the Minister is criticising us, yet we in our speeches have actually been calling on the, uh, the government to actually implement their climate policies. We are not rolling back from them, whether it's heating our homes, our transport, our buildings, or how we use our energy. You know, this is just criticism that is just not good enough. I think... Um, I would just point Sarah Boyack to the £28 billion hole in her uh, Shadow Chancellor's plans. Yeah, Your green exactly. investment Through policy the chair, has please. been dropped. You no longer support ultra-low emission zones while the Scottish Government is bringing them in yeah, in Scotland. Exactly. And of course, this is the same Labour Party who have accused this Government of focusing too much on social policy, something which was absurdly repeated yep. by Daniel Johnson today. Yeah, yeah. This is social policy which is lifting 90,000 children in Scotland out of poverty. I'll give way one last time, but I'm very conscious of time, presiding officer. 
Thank Does she Johnson. not recognise the fundamental point that you can only deliver that social policy if you have credible and robust economic policy? And doesn't it say everything you need to know about her and her government that she prefers to attack the Labour Party than the Tory Party? Because that's what we need to do. Get rid of the Tory Party in London and replace them. But you prefer to, the, you prefer to have them in exactly Members, where they are, don't you? Cabinet Secretary. I think the, um, Members, I think let's the, hear one another. I think the 90,000 children that are no longer living in poverty because this government recognised yeah. that you can do both, Mr yeah, Johnston. absolutely. <laughs> Up to nine minutes. Up to nine minutes. Thank you. I'll, I'll shortly conclude then. Um, <laughs> presiding officer, I just wanted to finish with a point on uh, opportunity. And perhaps one of the greatest ones that Scotland has is our energy transition with oil and gas having been and continuing to be a very important part of our economy yeah. and our society. But equally, as we stand on the precipice of a renewables revolution in Scotland, of course, the question for the people of Scotland is who do they want to oversee that transition yeah. and the eventual benefits of it? Is it, as has been uh, for, for decades since we discovered oil, do we want to continue to send our energy wealth down through the UK Treasury and see a pittance come back or a, bla a brass plaque on an office yeah. in somewhere in yeah. Scotland if Labour have their way? Or do we want to take these powers into our own hands and make sure that the benefits of it are reaped in the communities throughout Scotland? I know which I prefer. Thank yeah, you. Well Thank you. That concludes the debate on opportunity within the 2023-24 programme for government. And we move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 10379 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on changes to the business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press their request to speak button. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 10379 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. There are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion 10350 in the name of Hamza Youssef on motion of condolence for Winnie Ewing be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. Now, can I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Murdo Fraser is agreed to, the amendment in the name of Daniel Johnson will fall. So the next question is that amendment 10347.1 in the name of Murdo Fraser, which seeks to amend motion 10347 in the name of Neil Gray on opportunity within the 2023 to 24 programme for government be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we'll move to a vote. There'll be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.